Hey, this is Pastor John. Thanks so much for tuning in to either download or stream this study. Uh, we pray that this blesses you. There are a couple of things that we would like to lay before you quickly. Uh, number one is that you would consider this message supplemental in your walk with the Lord, that in no way would it replace either your being plugged into the church at the local church level or you listening to your local church pastor who has been charged with the care for your soul. Having said that, we do pray that um, this study of God's word would, would help you see and savor the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we would pray also that if, if this ministry blesses you, that you would prayerfully uh, consider supporting VXV. And if you do, you can do so by clicking on the link below or by going to our website at vxvchurch. Dot com. Now, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you, as you dial into now the, the proclamation of God's word. As always, I pray that you are well. As I had indicated uh, briefly in dismissing us last week, we're going to spend the next two Sundays, the next two Sundays, preparing our hearts to, to really dial into and, and zero in upon uh, this Christmas season here at VXV so, so that we as Christians, that we can really um, press past the shadows and, and really into the substance of what Christmas should um, be about. There is this tremendous pull, is there not? There is this tremendous pull to just get sucked into the vortex of all the consumerism and all the commercialism that if we are not careful, we can completely miss much of what this Christmas season should point us to, which was the divine invasion of God into all that was broken in our world on that first Christmas night, that wrath-absorbing, fear-displacing, peace-bringing, joy-giving, remarkable love of God that came crashing through space and time in the incarnation of Jesus. That's the substance. All the rest are just shadows. Now, there are a number of things that have led my heart to go where we're going to go uh, this morning. And so before we dive in, uh, I want to share some of that with you. You, you mean that wasn't diving in? Well, may maybe it was. Work with me. Uh, now, first of all, in each of the last two years, I've given us very little opportunity uh, to, to, to get before the, the madness and the activity of the season by grounding us in the gospel. In 2017, for example, our Sunday Christmas service fell on the 24th. Uh, which gave us the better part of a day uh, to reflect upon these things. And then last year in 2018, our Sunday Christmas sermon fell upon the 23rd, uh, which didn't give us a whole lot better. So for a week or so now, I began to go to the Lord earnestly in prayer. Uh, we just wrapped up our study of the book of Ruth uh, last week, and, and here we were with but one more Sunday before Christmas Sunday, and the initial thinking that led me in this direction was this. Now, the book of Esther, uh, which we'll be getting to uh, next after Christmas, uh, Esther is a very um, complicated book to introduce profitably, uh, because in so many ways, it's so unlike uh, most of the books in the Bible. We need to set that up well. I didn't think it made a heck of a lot of sense to spend today doing that, move over to Christmas next week, right, and then come back two weeks later and hit the introduction. I, I, my guess is we would have had to reintroduce the introduction, uh, inter introduction, and now we're doing the whole Department of Redundancy Department deal there. So, it began to occur to me that I thought it would be good for us to just come up uh, and breathe a little bit, come up for some air between books here, and much more importantly, to allow the Lord to meet us in this season and really prepare our hearts for how it is 
that he would have us to live and move and, and breathe in this very unique, unique space that we find ourselves in once a year. And there are wonderful opportunities, no doubt about it, that this season um, affords us. And, and yet, if we're honest, we do some pretty weird things that we don't do for the rest of the year, right? We hang socks over the fireplace that are already dry. We mix booze with raw milk and eggs. Where did that whistle come so I could pray? Uh, We leave milk and cookies out for no one on purpose. We knock on people's doors uninvited and sing to them whether they like it or not. We will watch the TV broadcast of a movie that we already own. And we will nod at the phrase, bah humbug, though we haven't the slightest clue what humbug even means. And I will tell you unashamedly, man, I'm in. I am in on the whole deal. I I am not the Christmas is a pagan holiday guy at all. I'm pumping the real Christmas music through Spotify into my Sony sound bar at home. And by that, I mean the classics. I want to hear Bing and Andy and Perry and those brothers, right? We've got the tree going, wreath on the door. It looks like Hobby Lobby threw up all over our mantles. I I mean, we are all in uh, at the Kohler house. Sarah and I are into the season. Season. Our kids are into the season. It's just, it's just great. We're in. Now, there is, however, the other side to this deal, and it's what many of us theological nerds call an over-realized eschatology. And by that, we mean somehow we're duped into thinking that this is the year that all of our Christmas dreams are going to come true. This is what the guys on Madison Avenue want to sell us. We're carpet-bombed by all these commercials and the Hallmark Christmas movies. We're inundated by every form of media and imaginable, imaginable, and it's all the same message. This is the most wonderful time of the year. But they're not talking about the birth of Jesus. What they're really presenting to us is everybody's going to get a Lexus, all right, and you all are going to end up at Jared buying diamonds, when the reality is most of us are going to end up with a 20-pound container of mixed nuts that somebody bought at the bank, the Barry Manilow box set, or a fruitcake with a shelf life of 20 years that's probably been re-gifted since 97, and somebody finally bites into the deal, breaks a tooth, Merry Christmas, aren't you glad you came to church today? Now, just two quick pieces of pastoral advice before we get to where we're really going this morning. Number one, husbands, your wives will tell you that they don't really care what you get them for Christmas. That is not true. It is a lie from the pit of hell. They care. All right, they care. Just don't get them a Peloton. Number two, and this is for all of our friends out in podcast land as well. Number two, on behalf of all parents of young children, I implore the relatives of said families, look, do not, I repeat, do not buy our children any toy that makes noise. All right. You don't have to live with this kid that has no job, no responsibilities whatsoever, other than to drive his parents insane with that little demon toy that you brought into our home. All right? I would sooner you bought daddy a root canal. All right? Well, what's with all the dental references? Leave me alone. Now, seriously, however... As wonderful as the Christmas season can be, and again, man, I'm all in. There can be a darker side to all of this whenever and wherever and to what degree that the person and works of Jesus Christ isn't smack dab in the very center of it all. Which means 
even for the Christian, man, we have to be very intentional uh, about not getting sucked into this over-realized eschatology because Christmas, the season itself, will make promises that it cannot deliver apart from Christ. Come December 26th, if you don't have Jesus, everything gets packed up and put away for another year, and you're left with what sociologists actually have a name for, the Christmas blues. Man, I don't want that for you. Listen to me. If we allow ourselves to be distracted from the substance of it all, from the glory of it all, if we turn and somehow find our backs to the glory of God, all we are going to see in front of us is shadows. We will not see the substance. And so here's what I want to do for the next two weeks. And let's just Get all the cards on the table up front here. What, what I want to try and do here is take this season that's just filled with um, expectations and anticipations, and I, and I want to redeem those expectations and redeem those anticipations by anchoring them in the glory of God that we ought to be beholding underneath and behind all of the celebrations that's, that is coming its way in a way that will create and sustain the kind of delight that will drive our lives well beyond this Christmas season. And so by the mercy of God, I, I want us to get after redeeming all of that this year, thus the, thus the getting in front of it a little bit. So here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> now, next week, we're going to get into what I would call a more traditional Christmas message in, in terms of the Christmas narrative itself. Now, let's, let's pause for a minute. Uh, and, and just um, consider the opportunity that, that is before us. Let's pause for just a minute. On your tables, as you've no doubt noticed, you are going to find some five by eight cards that are designed for you to hand out as invites to our Christmas service next week. Use them, and if you need more, there is a stack available back there at the Welcome Center. And now a, a word of caution. This does not mean we're going to gear our entire service to unbelievers because we're not, okay? We're going to get into the kind of Christmas message that I pray is helpful to believers uh, versus one that's not. I absolutely do not believe, I do not believe that the way to attract the unbelieving community is to put on a show for them. I don't believe the way to attract the unbelieving community is to water down the scriptures or the worship service in any way at all. Now, let's just have a quick little talk here. Can we do that? Uh, because I think it's super important, particularly considering uh, the season of opportunity that we have before us. Now, what I'm about to tell you, I'm not capping this because I know it comes from very good intentions, but here's where strong theology comes home to roost, all right? The dominant model uh, in the church for the last 30, 40 years has been what we call the seeker-sensitive uh, approach, a very well-intentioned model uh, that sought to reshape Sunday morning worship service in order to, to cater to what we call seekers. The only problem with that, however, is the word of God, okay? Which clearly tells us there is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. You see, the problem with the seeker-sensitive movement is the Bible says there are no seekers except one, okay? The only seeker in this redemptive drama is God himself, Jesus tells us plainly and explicitly, you've seen this before, you did not choose me. You did not seek me, but I chose you. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. And so look, the only seeker in this deal is God. Now, if you look at the Old Testament, the only people you will find in the worship services are the people of God. If you look in the New Testament, Acts 2.42, the only people in the church services were the people of God and, 
Acts 2.41, Acts 2.47, Acts 5.14, those that the Lord was adding to their number. And so in the Bible, the purpose of the church is to build up and edify the saints and to praise the glory of God in community and to pray together. Acts 2.42, they were devoted to the disciples' teaching, to prayer, and to fellowship. Now, does that mean people can't get saved in seeker-sensitive churches? Well, of course not. They can and they do. You do understand, right, that God's choosing and drawing and saving of human souls. If it were dependent upon the efforts of men, no one would ever get saved, right? God saves despite men. What I am saying is this. The very best way to attract those whom God is seeking and what we find in the scriptures is to simply let the unbeliever come in and see what the people of God are doing when they get here which ought to be digging deeply into his word to see and savor his glory and worshiping him for who he is, not what they can get. Okay? And so next week, we will gear our service for the people of God. And for those whom the Lord is seeking, are you hearing me? For those whom the Lord is seeking, let them see what the people of God ought to be doing. And it's not putting on a show because if God is drawing them to himself, he is not going to fail. We don't have to get cute because God never fails. He never fails in the drawing of souls to himself. One final scripture and we'll move on down the road. You've seen this one as well. For those whom he foreknew, he also, uh, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be, he being Christ, the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified, saving them from the penalty of sin. And those whom he justified, he glorified. That's all there in eternity, free from the presence of sin altogether. There it is right there. Why am I showing you this? To serve you by way of reminder whom God chose before the foundation of the world. All right. Oh, they're going to come. They're going to come. There is no stopping it. God does not fail. Not one of them will be snatched from my hand. We hear twice in John 10. Not one of them. They will come. All right? And so God does not fail and he cannot be stopped. And isn't it interesting? Again, whom he foreknew, he called, he justified, he glorified. So confident is God in this reality that he puts all of this in the past tense. Right? It's already done in the mind of God. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Because salvation does not depend on man, but it is all of God. Ephesians 2 8. And so when you're so let, let's let's bring it all back now. When you are inviting people for next Sunday, or when you're talking to anybody about Jesus over this season, just ripe with opportunity to do so, man, the pressure's off. Right? Like, we put all this pressure on ourselves. Like, why? Why is the pressure off? Because if God is drawing them, they're going to come sooner or later. You don't have to worry about how you invite or what you say or how to say it. You just be faithful, Matthew 10, 19. And so you can invite people, and if they respond, well, you know God is drawing them. Pretty cool. Now, think about just the prime opportunity here. Now, no doubt the Christmas message being broadcast by the, the wider culture falls far short of the gospel mark, but still, everywhere people go, the grocery store, the department store shoppers, the gas station, glory to the newborn king, and come let us adore him, are being sung to them on an endless loop. 
right? I mean, this, this is an evangelistic dream for the Christian to have these conditions. The entire culture, however unwittingly, is engaged in this mass marketing campaign to direct people to our churches on Sunday. So look, use these invitation cards. Let's capitalize on this enormous opportunity and we'll invite people to come and see what the people of God are doing and we'll get the immense privilege of watching God work and draw and save. All right, so that's next week. Now, what I would like to spend our time on today is again, trying to redeem for us all of the expectation and anticipation of the season for the glory of God. And as I said a moment ago, if we have our backs to the glory of God in this season, all we are going to see is the shadows. All we will see, we will miss much of what God has for you and I as Christians in this season. So we must turn and squarely face the glory of God if we are going to see the substance from which all the shadows are cast. If we're going to have any hope of flourishing, not just in this wonderful season, but far beyond. It is seeing, and I'll keep saying this to you on repeat in a loop, right? It is seeing and savoring the glory of God, all right? And that, that is what we're going to get after today, that we might find our delight, n- not in this season itself sort of compartmentalized into that, but, but what it is really that the season is pointing us to, and that is Jesus Christ. Christ. Now, uh, I must confess to you, um, unapologetically, Mr. Wilkinson over there can vouch for this. I have wanted to teach this family specifically concerning the glory of God for some time now, uh, and so I am marveling at um, God's timing and sovereignty and opening up this week as a, as a window to do this today. Now, the reason I've so longed to teach upon the glory of God is because uh, I recognize, uh, for starters, that, that look, in the church, there are certain words and phrases, are there not? There are certain words and phrases that are just thrown around with such frequency and with such casualness that the sheer force of what's at stake um, can, can get lost or, or diminished a bit. So uh, in the glory of God is certainly one of, of, of those phrases. And so I, I, I want you to be excited about this, not only because this is the perfect time uh, to grab onto all of this, but because I believe with every fiber in my being that what we are going to talk about today, in my tiny opinion, is the most important Christian concept for you to grasp in all of the scripture, okay? Everything in the word of God from creation to redemption to glorification is a function of and ultimately flows from his great glory and the great fame of his name. So let me put an assertion out there up front. All right, let me put an assertion out there and then we'll spend the remainder of our time really unpacking and understanding uh, the assertion I'm going to give you. So here it is. This is the truth we're going to fight for this morning. The supremacy of God's glory is the source and sum of all full and lasting joy. Let's read it again. The supremacy of God's glory is the source and some of all full and lasting joy. And so that, this is what we've got. And we're going to flesh it out biblically. Then we're going to bring it right into the shuffle and swirl of the, the season and, and all the activity we're in. It's going to be awesome. And so we'll see this again. Okay? Now again, as we've said We speak often of the glory of God here at VXV, don't we? We also speak uh, often of 
delighting in God here at VXV. And these two ideas, they are inextricably linked. And that's why you see them together here in the title of our sermon today, the glory of God and our delight in him. And if you can understand how these two ideas are intimately and profoundly related, I can tell you that your Christian experience will never be the same. Now, I think the place that we have to start is to attempt some kind of a working definition for the glory of God. And I have to tell you, because of the greatness of God and and his very nature and essence, which is just being so galactically beyond our ability to comprehend Isaiah 55, attempting this is nothing more than that, all right? It's, It's just an attempt, okay? But we must try in order to communicate. Now, there are words in our language, right? There are words in our language that lend themselves rather easily to definitions. There are others that just don't. They're more difficult. For example, take the words beauty and basketball. Now, if you don't know what a basketball is, I I should think I could remedy that fairly quickly. I can tell you it's a round, leathery ball, about nine and a half inches in uh, diameter that is filled with air. It's rather hard. It's bounced well. It's used to play a game after its own name, basketball. And if you get really good at putting this little ball through a slightly larger hoop at various distances, well, uh, then you can make several million dollars. Now... Trying to define beauty, however, trying to define beauty, well, that can get a bit more tricky. You might point to a glorious sunset or a pristine mountain range or perhaps your wife's face. See what I'm doing here, boys? Everything is practical. (laughs) But it's very, very, so you can point to all of these things. It's very, very difficult to put into words. And so, therefore, the reason that the glory of God is so difficult to define is because it's more like beauty than basketball, right? Are you with me? Now, the word holy is a lot like that, but the Bible helps us to get a hold of that. The word holy... When we, the word holy, uh, when we speak of God's holiness, we mean that he is utterly set apart. In fact, the word holy means to be separate, to be consecrated. And so when the Bible speaks of God's holiness, it means his perfection and his greatness and his worth are in a class utterly his own, right? So God's being holy, this is who God is, All right? God's being holy, that is who God is. It it, it means his manifold, God's holiness, that's his manifold perfections, his infinite greatness, his incomparable worth in the universe. God's being holy is who he is. Okay? And so with that now, perhaps we can begin to grasp what we mean by his glory. So let's go to the word. Isaiah chapter 6, and they were calling to one another, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, here you have the seraphim, very high-ranking class of angels there, and they are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. So, So this is who God is is he is holy holy is the lord and then you might expect them to say and the whole earth is full of his holiness but they don't say that do they they say the whole earth is full of his glory so now we're getting somewhere all right you see god's glory is his holiness his his holiness made manifest Okay, his glory is his holiness made visible. Okay, we get some additional help from Psalm 19. The heavens are telling 
of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hand. So the heavens are telling of the glory of God. This word for telling, Hebrew word safar, it means to declare, it means to broadcast, it means to show forth and it has a a very specific idea of celebration to it. All right? And so the golden sunsets, the pristine mountains, the galaxies and the stars, they all declare, show forth, celebrate his beauty and excellence, and we call it glory. Are you tracking with this? And so we're ready now to try and put the impossible into words. Okay? The holiness of God is who he is. The glory of God is you and I seeing and savoring something of his holiness. And so here's our working definition. The glory of God is the outward manifestation of his holiness. It is his holiness going public, if you will. You want a better definition? The glory of God is our seeing and celebrating the infinite beauty and worth and majesty of his infinite perfections. Now, that's a mouthful, but it works for me. Here's a simpler version. The glory of God is his perfect and infinite beauty and worth made known. And so we kind of got this, all right? We we kind of got this here. And so let's just put this on the ground, shall we? When the Bible says in Isaiah 6, the earth is full of his glory, we just saw that. When the Bible says in Psalm 19 and everywhere else, in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, all kinds of scriptures we could bring in here. What is God saying? God is saying, look at me. I am glorious. Would you Open your eyes, the glorious sunsets and the sweeping oceans and the fields of gold and the galaxies of stars. Listen to me. This is what I am like, only better. Okay? All these things are but shadows pointing to something altogether higher and greater and grander and deeper and far more colorful. It is all pointing to me. Is what God is saying. Now, now look right at me. When you are enjoying that next glorious sunset, Christian, all right, do not terminate your enjoyment of it upon the sunset itself. When you are enjoying that next glorious sunset, don't terminate your joy upon the sunset itself, but take it upwards and into the creator of that sunset because that's just a tiny sliver of his excellence. Now, you want to take the cap off of and blow up your enjoyment of that sunset? Don't terminate your joy in the sunset. Dial it up 10,000 notches by celebrating the beauty of its creator. Tell you what, we'll get back to that. Now, see if this makes better sense to you now. Most of you know the verse. So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. What are we saying? Whatever it is that you do, point to, show forth, celebrate, draw attention to, do it all to broadcast the beauty and excellence of God in the lives of those that are watching you. Now, statistically, this is about 30% of you. If you're sitting here wondering when the sermon is going to be over, if you are sitting here with great indifference to all of this, now I'm not, please understand, I'm glad you're here and I'm not capping you. I'm not judging you. All of us in this room were there at one time or another. And so I'm not hammering your indifference at all, but I do want to love you well. 
And so I am going to show you. I'm a pastor. We're in church. Too bad. (laughs) So I am going to show you why you're indifferent. And then I'm going to point you to the solution all in one verse. Are you down? All right, here it is. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. That's the 30%. Now, here's the one verse. In whose case the God of this world, that is the devil and his, the enemy, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they might not see the light of the gospel of what? The glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You see, the reason you are indifferent or apathetic to all of this is because you have an enemy that you know nothing of who has blinded your mind to this glory of God that we've been talking about. Now, how does he do that? By keeping you incessantly occupied with inferior things. The bigger house, the faster car, the drugs, the booze, the sex, the toys, the porn, the power, the promotion. I don't know what it is for you, but there is an enemy of your soul who will parade before you all manner of temporary inferior pleasures to keep you from the ultimate eternal treasure, Jesus Christ, the Savior of your soul. And that's why you're not joyful, joyful for any extended period of time. That's why you're not, you haven't found your rhythm in this world. That's why whatever does satisfy you doesn't do so for very long until you need bigger, better, faster, stronger, different, or more. You see, the human heart is a a ceaseless factory of desires that will never be met until it sees and savors the glory of God. It was created and wired to see and savor and long for. You were made for so much more. Please hear me. Now, the sunsets and stars and storms and streams and all the beauty of creations that awakens those desires in you, sure they declare, sure they celebrate, sure they broadcast the glory of God, but where the glory is made fully manifest, fully known, is in his son, Jesus Christ. Christ. The solution to your sin problem is right there in the same verse. It is the glory of Christ. Let's just, well, let's just jump down one verse uh, and you'll see this made explicit. Stay with me. For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of what? The glory of God. Where? In the face of Jesus Christ. You see, this is, this is what the enemy of your soul is seeking to blind you to. The glory of God made known in the face of Jesus Christ. Are you grabbing this? Well, watch now what the writer of Hebrews tells us of Jesus. And some of you have seen this before. He tells us of Jesus. He is the radiance of his what? Glory. The exact representation of his nature. Now, that Greek word for radiance there, it literally means brightness flashing forth. All right? Colossians 2 tells us that in Jesus, the fullness of God dwells in bodily form. That's what the writer of Hebrews is telling us right here that the glory of God, the glory of God is being made known, celebrated, coming forth, manifest and full. The glory of God is flashing forth, forth in the person of Christ. He is the exact representation of his nature. Now then, just what is the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ? Just what is that? I love it when you ask me what's next in my notes. Keep doing that. The glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ is God showing you who he is 
and what he's done. Listen now to remove the blinders. The glory of God is who he is and what he's done. The glory of God in the face of Christ is who he is and what he's done to remove the blinders. Well, what did he do? We could be here all day, but this is what he's done uh, in summary. He made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I know of few verses that are as dialed into the heart of the gospel as that. Now, this isn't just for unbelievers here. This is also for the indifference that tends to creep in even for the soul that sees. Right? You do not get away from the gospel. You don't move off of the gospel. Or guess what? Indifference is going to creep right back in. How do the blinders come off and stay off? It's this right here. Preach the gospel to yourself every day or you're just going to slap those blinders back on, man. How do they come off and stay off? The gospel. Live there, breathe there, turn it, look at it, ponder it, marvel over it. God wrapped himself in flesh in the person of Christ and took the full hit for all of my garbage, all of my sin, all of my attacks upon his glory. God wraps himself in flesh, absorbs the hit for all of my garbage and then turn around and right around and put his perfect obedience on me. That's insane. Gloriously insane. He takes the hit for all of our sin and then gives us his perfect righteousness. What a trade! Never cease to marvel over this or you're just going to find those blinders slapped back on. You mean to tell me, if you read this verse, you mean to tell me that the glory of God flashing forth in Jesus, that he took all of my garbage and turned right around and, and caused God to see me as perfectly obedient? I will take that exchange. Good God, y'all. I'm going to get into that song. War. Two. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, I know that one. But good God. It is so beautiful. So, you know, we're getting off the rails here. But, but listen to me, because here is, the, <laughs> here is the easiest way to say it. Let me bring it all home for you. God became what we are so that we might become who he is. God became what we are, and we'll really explore that next week, so that we could become what he is, free and beautiful and good and loved perfectly and glory-bound world without end. Everything else is a trap, deception, a smokescreen to see you from seeing that. And it works for so many. Now, back to those who are at present indifferent to the glory of God. This is what all the common graces of God are seeking to draw you to. The air that gives you breath. Right, The air that he allows you to breathe, the beating heart that allows your life to sustain, the sensory apparatus that he has given you in order to perceive the beauty of creation and in the sun and the stars and the sky. All of these common graces, friends, are designed to point you to his glory. Indifferent brother or sister, look, you were made in the image of God. 
Man, you were made for this. You were made to behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And I will be praying for you that maybe this is the day when enough of that crust is just scraped away so that you can see it. That this would be the day when all those blinders begin to fall off of you. That you might say, okay, man, this is why I exist. This is what I was made to see. All these things that I thought were attractive in the world, it was all pointing to him, to Jesus, who became what I am. So I could become what he is. If God is drawing you today, one day you will echo with the psalmist. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, let us then return to our axiom for the day and see if it rings just a little bit truer now. The supremacy of God's glory is the source and sum of all full and lasting joy. For the unbeliever, you will always be chasing shadows. The shadows may change shape, but they are shadows nonetheless. You will never find full and lasting joys in the shadows. You will only find full and lasting joy in the light. When you discover the supremacy of God's glory over and above all these lesser things that are deceiving you. You were made built, designed, wired from the womb before all of time to see and savor and show the glory of God and be fully satisfied in him. And one day you will be. I pray that journey begins today. Now then, we are going to move into the second half of the title of this sermon, of the glory of God and our delight in him, our delight in the glory of God. And for you who remain indifferent, not to worry, this will move much quicker now because of the groundwork we've laid for glory still coming after you though. Now, for those of you that see particularly for those strong believers in this room today, here's where the rubber hits the road and we are just going to jack up your delight in God. And I pray that you can grab this. I pray that you can grab what we're going to hit here. All right, because when the Lord uh, used Dr. John Piper uh, a number of years ago to just dial me into this wonder, it radically altered my relationship with God. It impacted my discovery like no, it impacted my ministry like no other discovery uh, then and since how I read the Bible, how I teach the scriptures. This was a watershed biblical reality for me. And as I've said earlier, I've longed to share this with you. Okay, so let's begin this way and let me bring you into a number of struggles that I was having and how the word of God just crushed those struggles. Okay, now once upon a time, there was a younger Bible teacher who had a couple of theological struggles. Eh, He's about 5'10", no hair on his head, pretty fiery kind of guy. Married way up like most of the men in this room. You know the brother. Kind of a jerk, really. I mean, that's why the church hired Wilkinson. I mean, every church needs the softer side of Sears, all right? (laughs) And we got a brother with salon quality hair to boot, all right? So uh, I, I suppose I've given it away, but but, but I remember having two very specific struggles as a Christian, two very different struggles, and yet what I now know to be intimately connected. The first struggle was this. There seemed to be a kind of disconnect, all right? There's a kind of disconnect between my desire for pleasure and my desire to be obedient to God's word. 
All right? I mean, surely those two things can't be compatible, right? I mean, I'm supposed to die to my own desires, aren't I? And Paul said, I die daily, 1 Corinthians 15, 31, right? And so I would think to myself, and it was such a, an, an utterly faulty, dysfunctional thought, but uh, looking back on it, but, but I would think to myself, well, now, if this thing over here is bringing me pleasure and happiness... It must, by definition, somehow, therefore, be unholy or, or somehow less than holy. I mean, how in the world can I put my own pleasure above obedience to God's word? And so, so there was this disconnect and this, this conflict between pursuing the desires of my heart and pursuing obedience to God's word. And so I would invariably end up compromising one, one of the two, right? Now, we'll get back to that. The second struggle is this. The second thing I struggled a bit to understand, and this was a, a far more subtle struggle, but it still bugged me. You see, years ago uh, in this ministry, as many of you know, we held an open mic Q&A session after every lesson. I remember that piece of yellow crumpled up paper I threw at you like uh, in uh, 2013? But you're not sleeping today, so we're good. But I remember a particularly nagging question that came my way that I answered all right, but, but I wasn't fully satisfied with the answer in my own heart. And isn't it amazing? Listen to me, and let me encourage you, out of our struggles is where the greatest growth comes. Don't blow off those things that you don't get, man. That, that is a kindness of God to bring you into a higher and clear understanding of his glory. So this question, I answered, I answered this question, but um, gosh, I, I sure wasn't happy with, with the question that was in my heart. Where the heck am I here? All right. Now, the question went something like this, okay? And I remember, it, I remember the question like almost seeming belligerent to me, all right? Uh, but it was a new believer, so okay. And, and this was the question. He essentially said, why is God so into himself? I mean, it seems to me that God is always saying he's so great and so awesome, like this big, giant, cosmic ego. I, I mean, doesn't First Corinthians 13 say love seeks not its own? I mean, what about, what are you, how, how does that work? Can you explain this to me? And he's always commanding us to praise him over and over and over. Why is God so needy? Does God, why does God need to have his ego stroked if he's God? And it was a really, it was a very astute question for such a young believer. Why is God constantly commanding us to praise him? Why is he constantly throughout the Bible, hundreds upon hundreds of times, extolling his own glory if love seeks not its own? So it was a very astute question for a young believer. Now, we're going back about 12 years or so, all right, about 12 years, uh, but my very unremarkable answer was, well, he's God, kid. I mean, I'm for crying out loud, this is God we're talking about here. He is totally other, totally holy. He is in a class altogether unique to him. You cannot project our own inadequacies upon God and then turn around and indict him. His holiness is beyond beautiful and excellent and infinitely perfect. And, and all of that was true, but, but I wasn't really helping the brother. My last words to him were something like, Soon you will understand, young grasshopper. <laughs> Although I didn't say young grasshopper. There was that kind of, it had that kind of condescending feel to it. And so I, you know, and of course, a few hours later, in the quietness of my own heart, I was hearing the Lord in my heart just whispering that same thing to me. No, 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 grasshopper, you don't understand. That very struggle would lead to answers that would turn my ministry literally right, right side up from that point on. I was the one that was upside down. Now, in the ensuing weeks, I had 
just being bugged by this. I, I had read about a number of high-profile people who had abandoned their childhood faith for that very same reason. People like Brad Pitt and Oprah Winfrey, to name a few. And then I remembered one of my heroes of the faith, the incomparable C.S. Lewis. I immediately remembered that he struggled with the very same thing. Before his conversion, after reading the Psalms one day, this was before he became a believer, after reading the Psalms, C.S. Lewis said that God seemed to him rather like a, a vain woman in need of compliments. But then after his conversion, he explains the following breakthrough. Now, Julie, this is a heads up. We're getting close, all right? So here, here's what he said. The most obvious fact about praise whether of God or anything, strangely escaped me. I had never noticed that all... Now, you guys dial into this. I had never noticed what escaped him, this. I had never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. The world rings with praise. Lovers praising their mistresses. Readers their favorite poet. Walkers praising the countryside. Players praising their favorite game. My whole difficulty about the praise of God God depended on my absurdly denying to us what we delight to do and cannot help but doing and everything else we value. We do, and here it is. We delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. Oh, man. Now we're on to something, aren't we? You see, what Lewis is saying is that the enjoyment of a thing does not reach its zenith until we express it, until we praise it. Like your joy is not made complete. Like, like if you, you, your wife, she, you're getting ready to go out on a date. She's all dressed up and she looks so beautiful. And you look at her and go, no. You, oh, honey, you're so beautiful. And you, your enjoyment of your wife is just coming to its fullness in the praise. Are you with me? Okay, so th this is not hard for us to get, okay? I, I think we can get this. A lot of Michigan basketball fans here. I'm going to bring back one of the best moments in your idolatrous life. <laughs> All right, here we go. So let, let me bring you back uh, to the NCAA tournament two years ago. Michigan's down two points against Houston. They've got three and a half seconds left. They've got the entire length of the court to go. Here's what happened. He rifles it right in front of us to Abdul Rahman at midcourt. Extra pass. And it goes for the win! The three pointer by Jordan Poole! A freshman has won it for the Wolverines! What just happened there? <laughs> what, that, what was that? Surely, sovereignty. <laughs> what just happened there? The team and the fans brought their joy of that outcome to its fullness by the praise, right? I mean, can you imagine like Mike Tilbury and uh, Cal Elkins watching that game together? You've got two rabid Michigan idolaters there. Could you imagine they're watching that game together? That shot goes in and they just look at each other like... No, no, that, that's not what we do. The praise isn't just the expression of the enjoyment. It's the completion of the enjoyment. The praise is what brings the enjoyment to its fullness. Our joy in a thing is not complete until it is praised. All right? That's when our joy is made full. Now, here is God... 
who is pleased to give us these common graces. He's pleased to give you the beautiful face of your lover or the marmalade sunset or even the buzzer beater. But the beauty will fade, the sun will set, and the game will be over. Whatever sliver of beauty you find in the face or the sunset or the buzzer beater, the affection and the beauty and the victory there, understand they are just echoes of a far superior affection and beauty and victory. They are not the thing itself. They are good gifts designed to point you to various aspects of the giver himself. You see, whatever among God's good gifts, or whatever that is for you, whatever among his good gifts that you find a beautiful or pleasing or of some value to you, they, they are merely images of what you were built to desire more fully. Now listen to me hard. These Gifts will betray you if you think the real beauty or value or victory was in them. It was not in them. It only came through them. And what came through them was this longing in your heart. A longing for the scent of a flower you had yet to find. the echo of a tune you had yet to hear, news from a far country that you had yet to visit. Oh, how I pray you're getting a hold of this. Because now we're getting somewhere. At the end of the day, the only thing that God can give us that will lead to the kind of delight that will drive our lives is his own glory that never fades or never sets or never is over. If God is a truly perfect God who loves you with a perfect love, he will seek the very best for you, will he not? And what is the very best thing that he can possibly offer you? It is himself. He is the very uh, he is the very thing that all these temporary inferior things are designed to point you to. Here, as C.S. Lewis helps us once again. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can fully satisfy. Well, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Listen to me. If there is so much sweetness in a drop, if there is so much sweetness in a drop, how much infinite beauty and sweetness can be found in the fountain? If there is so much splendor and just a ray of sunshine, what must the sun be in all of its glory? This is what the Lord wants you to see. This is why the entire Bible, and particularly the Psalms, are saturated with commands to know and praise his glory. It's what's good for you. Some 250 times in the scriptures, we find the exhortation to praise the Lord. Now, is God somehow in need of this? Or do you think he is doing us a favor? Let us go again to the word. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. You can't get away from that phrase. Well, there goes the Lord again. After his own glory there. By the way, I found the word glory 359 times in my New American Standard Translation. <laughs> Not talking about us. But again, does it sound like God needs anything here? I don't think so. For from him and through him and to him are all things. Like, like if all things are his, it doesn't sound like he needs anything from my hand. Let's be sure about that. 
nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. This text is telling you and I that everything that exists owes its existence to him. And that no one, no one or no thing can add anything to him that is not already flowing from him. Therefore, we can safely conclude that God's extraordinary zeal to seek his own glory and to be praised by men cannot be owing to his need to shore up some weakness of his or, or compensate for any deficiency whatsoever. And so here is now where we're landing with all of this. And this, uh, this is the answer I wished I had given that kid 12 years ago. God must be for himself if he is to be for us. The protocol for humility that belongs to the creature cannot possibly apply to the creator. And now here's where I'm going to ask you to think, but there is extraordinary joy around the corner, all right? If God were to in any way turn away from himself as the sum and source of all infinite joy, if God were to turn away in any slight degree from himself as the source and sum of all infinite joy, he would be denying the truth about himself, he would be lying, and therefore he would cease to be God. This is no gain for us. If God were to elevate anything is more valuable than himself, he would be denying the infinite worth of his glory and he would be committing what we so often commit, idolatry. If God were to value anything above himself, he would be an idolater and he would cease to be God. There is no gain in that for us. He must be for himself if he is to be for us. Whenever you and I sin deliberately, now we miss the mark, okay, but whenever we sin deliberately, what we are doing in that moment is saying there is something more important to us than his glory. Now, he did something about that though, didn't he? Really dial into, really dial into what I'm about to say next. If God is going to love you and I perfectly well, he must do two things. He must give us the very best thing in the universe. He must give us himself. That's number one. He must give us the very best thing in the universe. He must give us himself. And that was precisely his intention at the cross. The fullness of God dwelt in the body of Jesus Christ. He absorbed the wrath for all our unholiness, for all of our attacks upon his glory. He took away the consequence of all of our sin, and he laid it upon himself. He became what we are so we could become what he is, holy. If you have any idea, even the slightest smidgen of a clue of how high and holy God is, then you will understand something of the incredible condescension he subjected himself to in becoming a baby human who needed other humans to burp him and change his diaper. This high and holy God did that. We'll get to that next week. Extraordinary how low he made himself in order to lift us high. Number two, we said there are two things that God must do if he's going to love us perfectly well. Number two, having taken the consequence for our sin, if he is going to love you perfectly well, he must come after the fullness of your joy. 
God did not save you in order for you to be miserable. He saved you to be free. He saved you to flourish as a human being. Now understand the work that we've done this morning. We praise what we delight in because our joy is incomplete until we do. We praise what we delight in so that our joy may be made full. Therefore, if God loves us enough to make our joy full, he must not only give us himself, but he must win from us the praise of our hearts precisely so he can make our joy full. Because what you and I delight in, that's where the rest of our world's going to go. What is uppermost in your affections, that's where the rest of your world is going to go. And if you are going to come into the fullness of joy, then it must be the most magnificent thing in the universe that is uppermost in your affections, and that, of course, is God. If he is truly for us, he must be for himself. That is what I should have told that kid 12 years ago. That God is the one being in the universe for whom seeking his praise is the ultimately loving act. And now the first struggle I had mentioned, well, it just happens to vanish as well. Right? There is no conflict whatsoever in my desire to pursue pleasure as a human being and my obedience to the word of God if that pleasure I'm, I am pursuing is satisfaction in him. In fact, I am commanded to pursue pleasure in God. Here's just a few of those. There are many. Delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. What do you think God is doing this for you? To complete your joy. Shout for joy. All you who are upright in heart, rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven over the New Testament. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. If I am not, if I am not, all right, if I am not pursuing pleasure in God as the supreme desire of my heart, if he is not uppermost in my affections, then man, I'm only chasing shadows. I am settling for less than what the thing I am enjoying is to lead me to. I am settling for less, and I will not come to the fullness of joy that I've been wired and created to come into, and my soul will shrivel. Now, if you do not know Christ as your Lord and Savior... Man, I pray that this is the day that, again, enough of that crust has been scraped away from your eyes and your heart that you might begin to see the glory of God, that you might begin to really live to know full and lasting joy. And if that is this day for you today, well, then praise God it happened not by this idiot, but by his Holy Spirit revealing God's glory to you. I pray if that's your day, Man, will you come and find me and let me pray with you after the service and usher you into the family of God today. Let joy begin. And for those of you that are my brothers and sisters in Christ, I pray that you understand that your chief duty as a son or daughter of the king, your chief duty is to delight in him. That's your chief duty, to delight in your God because his glory is at stake. And you can probably finish this sentence right now, right? He is most glorified in you when? When you're most satisfied in him. Is that making more sense now? I remain utterly convinced 
that the only lasting way to have victory over sin is to replace our affections for those inferior things with a superior affection for the glory of God. Look, man, I, I don't need to teach you Christian behavior. That's not my job. I don't have to teach you Christian behavior. I don't need to tell you how to straighten up and fly right. I'm not here to extol you, to dot your spiritual I's and cross your spiritual T's. That's legalism. That's moral therapeutic deism. I'm not here to do that. What I am, however, under a holy obligation to do is to proclaim to you week in and week out the uncompromised word of God with one chief objective in mind to show Show you the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. To rip away and shred the blinders that bind. That you might find the full and lasting joy that your Savior died to make available to you in Christ. And so let us end where we began. And I hope this makes more sense to you now and we'll pray about this season and go home. The supremacy, the supremacy of it. Not just seeing God's glory, making it supreme in your life. The supremacy of God's glory is the source and the sum of all full and lasting joy. The supremacy of God's glory is the source and sum of all full and lasting joy. I pray that this truth has found its way into your heart this morning. It is at the very heart of our gospel, and I pray that it might serve as a, a real anchor for us in this wonderful yet pretty crazy season that we find ourselves in, and of course, way beyond. Let's pray together. Well, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for your zeal, for your own glory. And I pray now that we would understand that that is the ultimate loving act. That you love us enough to do that. God, I pray as we enter into the fray of this season that we wouldn't keep our eyes on the shadows, but that you would direct us upwards to your glory so that we might have just a, a completely different perspective on this next week and a half or so. God, for all those joyful things you're going to bring into our hearts, the family, the friends, the meals, the exchanging of gifts, would you help us to rip the cap off of that joy? Would you help us to not terminate our joy into those things that you have given us, but to see them as an extension of, of something so much greater, you yourself. You are so good and so loving to provide these things to us. I pray that you would rip the ceiling off of our joy by bringing it up to you to which it points. And I pray, God, for those of us who have um, lost loved ones or have difficult uh, emotions associated with this time of the year, I pray that your glory would be an anchor for them. That we're all empty apart from Christ. I pray that we would cling to the cross if this is a difficult time of the year, that we would cling to your glory, that your strength would be made perfect in our weakness. And God, finally, I pray for those that do not have a saving knowledge with you. Pray, Christians, would you? I pray, God, that you would just melt their hearts to see your glory, that you would expose the deception of the endless cycles of, of never really finding a rhythm in life and just looking to things to fill our hearts with when we were made to fill ourselves and be fully satisfied in who you are and what you've done. I pray that you would call them home this morning. And if that's you, I would just pray that 
Just repeat in your own heart. It doesn't matter what you say or how you say it because God knows your heart. You just say, look, Lord, I'm sorry. I haven't seen your glory. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Will you be my Lord and Savior? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I pray that happens for you today. Love you so much. So glad you're here. I don't want you to be deceived one day longer because we don't know what tomorrow holds. So God, thank you for your word this morning. And may your glory shine ever so brightly in our hearts this season and root us and and anchor us in, in all that is good and right and peaceful and holy. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Let's worship.